Thanks, Matt. Good, every, good morning, everyone. Do something. So it's in here, is it? Which one is yours? So it's this trackpad. Good morning, everyone, again. Uh, today I'd like to talk about observed changes in the walker circulation over the past century, and in particular, changes in the last few decades, and how well CMIP3 and CMIP5 models, particularly CMIP5 models, are able to simulate the observed changes. And that some of the specific issues that I'd like to address this morning are, first of all, how has, it, how has the walker circulation changed over those periods? Um, do the models simulate those of the observed trends since 1900 and 1980? And if they do, fantastic. If they don't, why don't they simulate those trends? And we'll find that the models don't seem to be able to capture the observed strengthening of the walker circulation since 1980. And so we'll examine some of the reasons why that might be the case, and then we'll briefly consider what implications uh, that apparent deficiency might have for the confidence we have in projections of the walker circulation over the coming century. And then I'd like to finally finish by outlining key challenges and opportunities that arise from this study. So if you want more details on much of what I'm going to talk about, it appeared earlier this year in the uh, Journal of Climate and it was work I did with Greg Kachuba. And I'd also like to acknowledge helpful discussions with Jinjia and Didmar. The first thing you need to know, to, to know about the walker circulation in the observations is that it weakened during the 20th century. And just one illustration of that, and there are many publications that have addressed this, this is just one illustration where the walker circulation is tracked, or the strength of the walker circulation is tracked using the difference in mean sea level pressure across the Pacific between these two boxes, east minus west. And then if you take a time series of that difference calculate the trend over the, 90, over the 20th century, you find in the, in the circled uh, ellipse that you get downward trends, weakening trends from 1876 through to 1999 and from 1900 through to 1999 and also from 1958 to 1999. And you find that those first two, the two longer trends, or the trends over the two longer periods, are both statistically significant. So there was a very interesting weakening of the walker circulation during the 20th century. And you can update this information using data, uh, more recent data. And so this is a quite a complicated plot. It shows not only the observations there in uh, pink, or something close to pink, on the left here. So that's the trend in that index for the strength of the walker circulation over the period 1980 to 2012. And you can see that it's declined, but you can tell by the, from those brown, rusty coloured whiskers that it wasn't statistically significant. So that, that brown, the brown whiskers are an estimate of the 95% confidence interval for the trend. And then the other trends are um, from the models, from the CMIP5 models. And you can see there's quite a mixture. Some go up, some go down. Most of them go down. Um, and if you look at the multi-model mean of all of those results, on the far right here, you get a, a, a negative a weakening. And that weakening is statistically significant. So the situation seems to be quite um, comforting that there's uh, an externally forced weakening of the walker circulation over this period, but there's also a huge amount of natural variability. And so there does seem to be a good uh, consistency between what the models are saying should have happened, an externally forced weakening um, reinforced by internal natural variability. And you get lots of variations because of that, uh, if that is what's actually going on among the models, just as you would expect. So after you looked at this, you might... Um, oh, and then we also had a previous study looking at the 20th century, which, in which we concluded, and others have concluded, like Gabe Vecchi and his colleagues, that both external forcing and internal variability are needed to account for that observed weakening over the 20th century. And the results that we've just looked at for the uh, longer period, up to 2012, are consistent with those earlier conclusions. And in this earlier paper, we concluded that there was high uncertainty about the relative 
importance of those two factors, internal variability, external forcing, but we estimated that the external uh, forcing accounted for something like 30 to 70 per cent, with internal natural variability making up the rest. So the models and the observations seem consistent. We have a nice um, physical framework for explaining what's happening. The observed trend driven, seems to be driven by a combination of external forcing and, and internal variability. And so the world seems very simple. And climate science seems so easy. So it's time to move on to something else. But um, let's now turn to what's happened in recent, more recent times. And specifically, let's look at trends over the period 1980 to 2012. And again, the framework's the same. So this, on the left of screen, is the observed increase. So there's been a, an increase in the strength of the walker circulation over this period in the observations. This time the whiskers are above zero, so it's been a statistically significant increase in the strength of the walker circulation over this period. But then when you look at the models, None of the models show a statistically significant change, and about half the models show a statistically uh, sorry half the models show an increase, half, around about half the models show a decrease, and if you look at the multi-model mean for this period, 33-year period, you get a negative number, but it's not statistically significant. So there does seem to be a degree of inconsistency between what the observations did and what the models say should have happened, because you notice that. See this, red, this green line here is the, the value of the observed change. You see that none of the models give you an observed change as large or larger than the observed change. And in fact, none of the models give you a decrease as large or larger in magnitude as the observed change, depicted here by the dashed line. So there does seem to be an inconsistency. I mean, one way of reconciling this inconsistency is to say that there's been this very large, very large internal natural variation. So that would give you consistency, but maybe that's not what's happening. Maybe there's some deficiency in the models that it's making, that's causing, primarily causing this inconsistency. You can't rule out the possibility that it's very large internal variability based on this, but you could park that candidate to one side and explore other candidates and that can, other can, the other candidate, and that other candidate is there's something wrong with the model or something, something wrong with the way the models are forced. So let's explore that second option. Uh, so just to summarise those results, we've seen an observed statistically significant increase in the strength of the walker circulation over this period. None of the CMIP-5 models exhibit a trend this large. Uh, the CMIP-5 models are roughly evenly split between increases and decreases, and none of the models exhibit statistically significant trends over this period. And the multi-model mean is, is negative, but it's weak and it's not statistically significant. And by the way, we've used this index to track the strength of the walker circulation, but there's lots of um, complementary supporting evidence to indicate that there has been a strengthening of the walker circulation in recent times. And here are some of the studies um, that have looked at this issue. Most of them are on shorter timescales, um, but they've looked at a variety of different variables, SST, wind, um, for example. So, Based on the plot that we showed before, there might be a problem. And so in order to, so what, how can we reconcile what's happened in the observations with, with what is supposed to have happened in the simulations? So we've already discussed the possibility that it, it arises from unusually large, an unusually large internal variation. But a question is, well, how unusual must this internal variation have to be to account for the, obs for the uh, results? So we've already pointed out that that observed trend was statistically significant. So in that sense, the trend is unusual in terms of, the, in terms of nature's own variability. But another question you can ask is how unusual is that trend in magnitude relative to the variability that the models exhibit? And in order to address that question, what we did was to analyse a very large number of pre-industrial runs. And we looked at that same variable in those runs we had over, if you accumulate all of the information, you get over 17,000 years of output. And so we calculated all possible 33-year trends in that data. And we found that um, out of that 17,000 years, you ended up getting 11 events. There were 11 33-year trends that were as large or larger than the observed one. And there were 15 that were as large in magnitude, but they're of opposite sign. And if you add all that up, work it out, it's roughly 
roughly you get one and a half of those events every thousand years. So yes, according to the models, you can get the observed trend just from internal natural variability, but it's a rare event. So maybe uh, one other possible explanation for um, what might give rise to this apparent in inconsistency is maybe the models are underestimating the level of natural variability in this particular variable. And so in order to um, test that idea, what we did was to take the time series of this mean sea level pressure difference along the equator and we calculated the standard deviation of the variance, uh, of the variability both in the historical runs and in the pre-industrial runs. And the observed value is marked by the de red dashed line. You can see the observations uh, are up here. And the, the y-axis is a mystery variable which uh, we'll come to in a, in a moment. So this is the standard deviation of the variability in that index that we've been talking about. And you can see that for most of the models exhibit variability that is larger than the observed variability. So this is one of the world's most short-lived hypotheses, that we, we hypothesised that the variability in the models were too weak, but the very first plot we show is that actually it's the reverse, the models tend to be too vigorous. But this shows the total variability. What's more relevant to what we're talking about is the variability on decadal timescales. So this is the same thing, but prior to calculating the standard deviation, we calculate, we, we run our 13 year running average through it, and then we calculate the standard deviation of those pre-industrial runs and the historical runs. And what you find in that case is that the vast majority of models exhibit variability that is smaller than the observed estimate. So for some, some reason, uh, if you look at all of the variability, the models are too energetic, whereas if you just look at the decadal, the models seem to be too weak. Now how, how on earth can that be the case? If the variability was just a white noise process, this wouldn't make sense. I mean, one way you get a difference between the left and right panel is through just sampling error, but you know, the vast majority of models are, are showing this behaviour. Vigorous behave, too vigorous behaviour for total variability, not enough on decadal. Well, one way, or the only way of reconciling this is to look at the details of the autocorrelation function. So that there's a strong connection between uh, the right, re relationship between the standard deviation on the right-hand panel to the standard deviation on the left-hand panel to the properties of the autocorrelation function. And so we finally get to this mystery variable, which is the lag one autocorrelation. So you can see that the observed value is up here, 0.3, and you can see that the majority of models exhibit too little persistence. And in fact, there's a large chunk of models, a large number of models, exhibit um, a lag one autocorrelation value which is negative. So what that means is even if the internal, if the interannual variability is large, it's going to make it harder for those models to generate multi-year decadal variability, and indeed it's going to make it harder for those models to generate 33-year trends, you know, multi-decadal trends. That's just A1. We also looked at A2, and lo and behold, we also find there's a tends to be deficiencies in A2 as well. In the observations, the lag 2 autocorrelation value is you know, pretty close to zero, minus 0.09, whereas the multimodal mean value is minus 0.3. And it turns out there is a, that you can go to textbooks and work out what the spectrum looks like for an AR2 process. And if you plug in the numbers and you put in this bias, you, lo and behold, you find that the weighting or the, the spectra at decadal and longer time scales will tend to be too weak because of this particular defect. So you've got the problems at A1, with A1, you've got the problems with A2. So you've got the problems with the interannual variability giving rise to problems in the ability of the models to simulate decadal, multi-decadal trends. So you might think that you can just put problems with ENSO to one side when you start talking about 33 year trends, but this illustrates that you can't necessarily do that. So. Yes, the answer is model decadal variability does seem to be too weak, and this will certainly contribute to the apparent inconsistency that we showed in one of the earlier plots. But of course, there are other possible candidates that might also be contributing to the inconsistency. Um, we've already talked about that there does seem to have been a large natural occurring internal variation in the observations. That's going to help to produce apparent inconsistency. But of course, you could also have 
um, problems associated with forcing being omitted or misrepresented in the models, or there might be a problem with the model response to the forcing imposed. And I think the point is that we've learnt something about, you know, we've established that it does seem to be an apparent inconsistency. You can reconcile it with, um, if you suppose that the internal variation is very, very large. The models seem to underdo the natural internal variability, which, which would promote inconsistency, but we don't fully understand the cause of that inconsistency, and in particular, we don't fully know the answer, uh, the magnitude of these effects that I've got here in the black dot points, or their relative importance in this issue. So, thank you, Matt. So um, now we turn to, that's all looking at the past, what happens, what do the models project will happen in the future? Well, there's been for several generations of models a consensus among the models that there'll be a weakening of the walker circulation in response to um, business as usual increases in greenhouse gas concentrations over the 21st century. And the CMIP-5 models are no exception. So this shows the trends over the 21st century in the strength of that index, the strength of the walker circulation, and you can see in the majority of models it's projected to decline. And the multi-model mean value, again, is on the left, and it's down here, and there's the value that runs along there, and it's uh, statistically significant, and it's, uh, it's the same, very similar results. You get the same or very similar results using CMIP-3 models. So this agreement, te this tendency for agreement among models, both within CMIP-5 and CMIP-5 relative to CMIP-3 increases confidence that the walker circulation is going to decline in strength over the coming century. However, um, our confidence in those projections, on the other hand, is weakened by the fact that we, aren't, we can't fully account for this apparent inconsistency in the, in, between the observed and modelled trends in the last few decades. So we need to temper our um, enthusiasm for, for, for the projections that are uh, taken from CMIP-5 models. And in particular, two, um, two outstanding issues are, do the models overestimate the magnitude of the externally forced weakening? Or if you want it to be even bolder uh, and more, um, you want to generate a bit of discussion, you might even say, how confident should we be that there is actually going to be a weakening in response to the external forcing? Can we dismiss the possibility that the models or multi-model mean projections actually has the wrong sign. And so um, the final slide is to present just some of the challenges and opportunities that um, arise from this study. And it really stem the challenge really and the opportunity stems from the fact that the walker circulation is really one of the world's most important atmospheric wind systems. And it's exhibited this very marked strengthening over a fairly long period, over 30 years. And so this con constitutes a very major event in the recent history of the Earth's climate system. And yet, we don't fully understand why that's the case, nor do we fully understand why the models and the observations seem to be inconsistent. Maybe the, the, um, the explanation that I provided earlier in the talk is the full explanation, but we don't know for sure. And so a challenge and opportunity is to redress those two issues, you know, to come to a better understanding of those two points and to determine the relative importance of all the other, all the plausible candidates for what might be causing that inconsistency. And hopefully that would, by investigating that issue more carefully, um, that could prove to be a route to provide significant advances in our understanding of Pacific climate variability and climate change. Thank you.